Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to APBP's webinar on women's cycling. We're delighted that you have joined us. We have a distinguished group of presenters and we'd like to go ahead and get started. This is the fifth annual women's cycling webinar and each year we riff on the theme of women, uh, the Women's History Month and this year the topic is women of courage, character, and commitment, and we have added moving, active, sustainable transportation forward. My name is Kit Keller. I'm Executive Director of the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. We have a few attractions coming up that I'd like to make you aware of. If you're interested in the topic of active transportation, we at APBP offer a monthly webinar program always on the third Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern Time and in April in celebration of the American uh, Public Health Association's Public Health Week we are going to be doing uh, a topic involving active transportation and I believe the the Health Week is actually the first full week in April so we're we're continuing on to talk about public health later in the month we also have a variety of free webinar recordings that are available not only of our past women's cycling webinars, but also a few webinars that are leading thinking in the field as to how cities are designing spaces, places, and the public right-of-way for more people to be able to walk and bicycle and to do it safely. So I would especially like to bring to your attention several free webinars we did with the National Association of City Transportation Officials, NACDO. We were early adopters of their excellent Urban Bikeway Design Guide, which has also been recognized by the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration as a resource that cities can look to in planning the bikeways in communities. So check that out. And then more recently, NACTO has published a wonderful book called The Urban Street Design Guide, which includes a lot of information on new techniques for making streets safer, more enjoyable places that contribute to the economic vitality of communities in a variety of ways and one of my favorite parts in that book is the discussion of parklets. So do check that out and if you're really intrigued by the idea of making your community more walkable and bike friendly we have good news that the Pro Walk, Pro Bike, Pro Place conference is coming to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania September the 8th through the 11th and registration for that conference is open Although it is not directly APBP's conference, we're big supporters and we will be there in force, so we hope that you will join us there. Without further ado, I'd like to jump into today's webinar, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you our panel of six distinguished speakers. Today we'll hear from Celeste Chavis, Ph.D., Assistant Professor, Transportation and Urban Studies at Morgan State University. Catherine Cordham, Ph.D. in P.E., is Program Officer at the Transportation Research Board. She also is International Chair of Young Professionals in Transportation. Fanula Quinn, P.E., is Associate at Alta Planning and Design, and Fanula has been very involved in the women's cycling effort, and in fact, um, I credit her with getting us started a number of years ago. Anna Ricklin is manager at American Planning Association's Planning and Community Health Research Center. Tiffany Robinson is formerly senior planner with the RBA Group in New Jersey and Tiffany has recently relocated to Los Angeles. Leah Treat is director of the Portland, Oregon Bureau of Transportation. I'd like to highlight a few of their accomplishments and also 
include on your screen their short bios. We will be sending today's slides out uh, to those of you who have signed up for the webinar, and you'll either get the slides direct, uh, directly as a PDF or you'll get a link to our website to be able to take a look at them. Celeste Chavis is really a remarkable woman and she brings a variety of experiences which include her strong interest in public transportation systems. So we're going to be eager to hear from Celeste. Uh, Catherine is involved in TRB's wide variety of committees on transportation policies and technical activities and we're also eager to have her speak to us about young professionals both at TRB and internationally. Fanula Quinn hails from Ireland originally and is now living in Northern Virginia and she's been very involved with the Fairfax Advocates for Better Bicycling. That group put out a, a super guide on how to more effectively advocate for bicycle facilities, so check that out as well. Uh, Anna Ricklin has seemingly lived all over the country and she began a lot of her interest in this topic based on what she saw in Portland, Oregon. Then moved to Baltimore for grad, grad school and uh, has continued that interest. So a nice marriage between public health and planning, which uh, we want to hear more about. As I mentioned, Tiffany is now in Los Angeles and she is car free, which is hard to imagine for many people, um, but more and more of the people in Tiffany's generation are choosing to be car free and it's, that's all the more reason why it's important for us to make sure that we are offering a full array of transportation choices in communities. And last but not least, uh, Leah Treat was most recently at the Chicago DOT where she was involved in getting a TIFIA loan to expand the Riverwalk there and was in Chicago also when the city installed its very first protected bikeway network and launched its bike share program. So I think with that we'll begin and I'm pleased to turn the controls over to Fanula Quinn and to welcome Fanula. How's that? Beautiful. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Great. Great, thank you, Kit. Um, well, Kit and I worked together on the APBP Women's Cycling Survey um, back at the very start of 2010. And when we got 13,000 responses very quickly, we knew we had raised an important topic. And in retrospect, um, looking back, we conducted that survey exactly 100 years after U.S. women had first taken to driving the automobile in, in numbers in the U.S. But in 1910, 100 years ago, women didn't have the vote, it was pre-civil rights, and the whole field of um, traffic and transportation design and engineering had not really been conceived of. Um, traffic engineering uh, uh, largely came out of the concepts of municipal engineering um, that had been developed for the likes of uh, water utilities. So 100 years later, the whole field of traffic design and management and operation had been developed. And we found ourselves asking questions about you know, one aspect of it, which was to do with women's um, participation in cycling. And um, in early 2010, we held our first webinar, um, really to report on that survey and really to discuss some of the issues that had been raised and that people were so interested in talking about. And um, we featured a number of speakers. And I don't think we realized then we'd be coming back every year to talk more and more about different aspects of this topic. Um, we came back a year later. Um, by that point, there was a lot more conversation going on about the, the whole topic of women in cycling. And interest had not waned. Um, I think by 2012, we were starting to report on some of the great programs that were out there. Many of them were already out there, but 
um, the topic of women in cycling had sort of cast a spotlight on the good work they were doing, and people were trying to model their programs elsewhere. And then by 2013, we had sort of circled back to the topic, which was kind of at the core of the conversation for us, which was um, the people behind the designing of bicycling communities and how the design was performing for um, women and all the users um, of the, uh, the built infrastructure. Um, so since um, 2010, a whole lot has happened nationally on the topic of women and bicycling. There have been forums, events, um, new groups formed, lots of new local programs. It has been very exciting. A lot of it has focused on getting women on bikes, um, women of all ages and abilities, and that's been very exciting. Um, um, but meanwhile, a key part of this discussion has always been the decisions we make about the built environment and what the role, what role those play in bicycling access, safety, and participation rates. And hand in hand with those considerations has been the role of planning, policy, and design professionals in shaping future improvements and operations. Um, these are the change agents for the future built envir environment. And a key realization has been how many of those leaders um, have been women. Um, and again, that's something the conversation has, um, ha has really brought out. Um, this includes the heads of transportation departments, the heads of bicycling and pedestrian design firms, and some of the leads in bike share. Um, the same has also been found to be true in bike advocacy. Um, so no longer are the people in all of these roles um, always engineers, but there are new leaders bringing fresh perspectives and priorities in their, in, in their leadership. So this has been a very exciting conversation to be a part of and to be able to bring attention to some of the aspects of. So I'm now actually going to hand it back to Kit um, to introduce our first speaker today. Thank you so much, Fanula, and we're amazed to have one of those new leaders in transportation policy at the local level, Leah Treat, and it's our pleasure to welcome you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. It's my pleasure to be a part of this. Um, just want to make sure that you see my screen and hear me okay. Yes, everything is great. Great. Wonderful. Well, I want to start off my presentation with an inspirational quote from one of the pivotal figures in the women's suffrage movement, Susan B. Anthony. Not only did she have that great dollar coin named after her, but um, she was a huge advocate of cycling. She was born in 1820 and died in 1906, and over a century ago she said about cycling, I think it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. It gives women a feeling of freedom and self-reliance. I stand and rejoice every time I see a woman ride by on a wheel. Despite these empowering words, women are underrepresented in bicycling. In the following slides that I'll share with you today, I'm going to give you some data that we have from Portland on women's participation numbers and what Portland has done to increase uh, the participation of women in our cycling um, community. Portland has long considered um, the participation of women in bicycling to be a bellwether for how effective we are at making bicycling a comfortable everyday activity. And in the world's best bicycling, bicycling cities, we know that the proportion of women bicycling is equal to or surpassing that of men. We understand fairly well the reasons why female ridership lags behind that of men. So if you look at this chart, you can see uh, the data. Um, but basically, in a nutshell, what this chart shows you is we haven't yet created comfortable enough, desirable enough roadway conditions to encourage the average woman to ride. This chart was created by Jennifer Dill, a well-known professor, at least here in Portland, of urban studies and planning at Portland State University, and Nathan McNeil. And this chart demonstrates the clear differences in the willingness of women who are in the orange columns and men in the green columns to ride under different conditions. So what do we uh, extrapolate from this chart? 
what we believe, it is clear that we need to build a system and create conditions that make it safe for women. And if we build an environment that's safe for women, we'll also attract men. Uh, Professor Dill and uh, McNeil found that for all but one facility type, women felt significantly less comfortable than men. Women felt nearly as comfortable as men on low traffic residential streets with tra traffic calming features. So based on the research from PSU and other research we've done here at uh, the Portland Bureau of Transportation, we have begun work to create much safer riding environments. The outcomes of these efforts have seen growth in both overall ridership and the use of bicycles by women. And this growth correlates strongly with increasing safety in the city of Portland. We've seen that as ridership has increased, the number of reported crashes have held more or less constant, which means that we have a declining crash rate. As Portland has improved its bikeway network in both quantity from 81 centerline miles in 1992 to 329 miles in 2012, and have made improvements in quality such as bike boxes, bike signals, improved crossing, cycle tracks, et cetera, we've seen the ratio of men to women change from 4 to 1 in 1992 to 3 to 1 in 2000 to approximately 2 to 1 by 2008. So we've seen the proportion of women riding go from 19% to 32% over that time period. However, as I said, it stagnated in 2008, and I am really pushing hard to get that number to a minimum of 50-50. Not surprisingly, we've also found in our data there's higher helmet use among women than men. This chart shows that women appear to be more safety conscious than men, wearing their helmets at a higher rate citywide than men do. And it also shows uneven use by women in different parts of Portland. So Southwest Portland and East Portland are generally recognized to have the most uncomfortable conditions for bicycling and have both the lowest proportion of women cyclists, but also the lowest rates of bicycle use overall. We also see the highest proportion of women bicycling in those parts of town where bicycle use is both highest and generally considered the most comfortable and the most safe. The locations shown here are where women represent at least 40% of the cyclists counted. The locations that are highlighted in the orange circles are what I'm talking about. And they correlate strongly with the parts of the city where conditions are best for bicycling and where bicycling use is the greatest. There are also areas uh, where these are also the areas where women's bicycle rates are high, and they have an average bicycle commute rate of approximately 10%. Conversely, those areas where cycling by women is low, around 17%, you see that in the red, um, are also those parts of town where bicycle use tends to be low with commute rates of 2 to 4% and where conditions for bicycling are uh, arguably the least safe. Um, I ride my bike to work every day, and I did this while I lived in Washington, D.C., and also in Chicago before the launch of Bike Share and before the advent of bike lanes, and I still do it in Portland, but I know that I'm in the minority. Um, one of the reasons uh, I chose to, to be a bike commuter is I found over the years that my children were really inspired by my doing this. They wanted to ride to learn bikes at a young age, and I still, to this day, as they've grown up, overhear them talking to their friends about how cool it is that I ride a bike everywhere. And I've heard my daughters tell their friends, oh my gosh, she even does it in a dress and heels. So um, it sounds somewhat funny, but it's meaningful for me to know that I'm setting an example for my children, and I'm also setting an example uh, about healthy choices. And it's not just to my family, it, it ripples through the community. Um, as I'm seen as the leader here for transportation. 
is also, I have to say, cycling is a great way to spend time for your kids. And if you capture them early, you can instill the values of a healthy lifestyle. So teaching them how to ride a bike or make them walk to places you don't normally do, like birthday parties or school or daycare, is actually not only instilling the great values we want to in our kids, but it's also quality time with our children. So I love this. This is one of my favorite pictures. And uh, Peabot recognized that we needed to do more early on to get women on bikes, that they were going to be the harder community to um, get involved. So we started a program called Women on Bikes in 2005. It was one of the first women-specific programs in the United States and the first government-organized women's program. Uh, through, the workshop, through the workshops from Women on Bikes and data collection, we have learned that the biggest barriers to riding are the time or distance, scheduling, which includes childcare, weather, and safety, and also includes infrastructure and the perceived safety of other drivers and other cyclists. So we set out to tackle these issues head on and created Women on Bikes. So far, over 1,000 women have participated in our rides and clinics, and women of all ages are participating. There's, uh, we've had it as young as 20 and as old as 70, but we found the majority of the participants are 40 to 60-year-olds. Um, the goal of the series is to increase the comfort and safety of new and seasoned female cyclists. We also want to develop riding and bike handling skills. We obviously want to increase the trips made by bicycle. We want to teach women basic bike maintenance and knowledge so they feel safe if they get a flat or something breaks down that they're not stuck. Uh, we want to develop a network for women to connect for social rides increase awareness of the health benefits of cycling, increase the knowledge of Portland's bicycle network, and we really want to introduce women to local bike shops so they can build relationships that are local. So I want to give you just a few quotes of um, participants from our program that are, are most meaningful for us. Uh, one woman told us, I attended one of your clinics. It built my confidence about being able to take care of my own bike. I found the hands-on experience in your maintenance clinic to be the most valuable. The confidence I feel in negotiating traffic and figuring out my routes is channeling itself into other parts of my life. And the 10 pounds I've lost by commuting by bike has been a side benefit to feeling empowered by the experience. Another woman told us, I loved the clinics. Until this summer when I started coming, the bike stayed parked in my living room. It's not true that you can just get back on a bike and start riding. Your clinics and the support of the other women attending the clinics was great for education and great for morale. I feel very supported and encouraged. I'm thinking of buying a lighter weight bike, and thanks to your clinic, I know what I'm looking for. We've also had many people thank us for the um, program and offering it through the government. Otherwise, they, wouldn't, they felt like they wouldn't have access to such hands-on training and information. Um, and the thing that we love to hear the most, and this quote says it, is because of the Women on Bikes clinics, I bought a new bike and I began riding to work. And even if it's one day a week, we feel that's a huge success. We also organize on an annual basis a ride for women on bikes, and we do it during Women's History Month. And we've done this every year for the last three years, and we generally get around 40 people. And the majority of them have fun, which means that they're going to spread the word and help keep the program going at the community level. And those are my uh, remarks for today. And thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate being a part of this. Well, brilliant job, Leah. Thank you so much uh, for giving us information about your program, what you're doing, how things have changed. This is so helpful. Um, before we move to the next speaker, I'm going to launch a poll, and you will see it in just a moment. We'd like to know how many people are watching the webinar at your location. This helps us with our planning. And APBP always encourages people to get together with others to watch our webinars and to advance efforts to make communities more walkable and bike-friendly. 
So please do take the time to vote. It helps us a great deal. We've got just over 75% have voted, so we'll leave it open for just a moment. And uh, Leah, your slides reminded me that women of all shapes and sizes can ride a bike, and that is such good news. Really appreciate your what you've showed us. Uh, so we will go ahead and close the poll now and um, show the results. We can share those results. So those are up on the screen for you to see. And with that, we will move to the next presenter. And we'll hear next from Anna Ricklin. So Anna, you'll see the slides coming to you now. And we see your slides, so we'll check your audio. All right, here I am. Good. Welcome. Great. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. I'm really excited to join this group of amazing women um, during Women's History Month to talk about health and, or to talk about transportation and women. And my focus, of course, is on public health. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different tack uh, than our private previous presenter and talk a little bit more about my career and how I came to be where I am now and um, and it really has been tracking sort of where I've been living and what I've been working on. So transportation has definitely been the inspiration for my focus uh, in public health and the reason why I want to help change the shape of our built environment. So um, it started when I was living in Portland and working on a job with the city for the Travel Smart campaign, which was a campaign to um, get people to get out of their cars and choose transit, choose to walk, choose to bicycle. And it was a very individualized marketing campaign to um, help people change their own behaviors that would match their lifestyle. So here's a photo of the Interstate Max um, light rail line that had just opened when I was moved to Portland in 2004, and that was the area that we were focusing our campaign on. And it, prior to that, I had been a bicycle commuter and bicycle rider for recreation and transportation, but hadn't really thought about how important it was to shift more and more people to riding bikes. And, and this work really um, opened my eyes to that and made me think about how transportation really is the determinant of how our built environment is shaped. And everyone has to get somewhere. And the street grid really does determine where we put our buildings. You can change the buildings in between, but the street grid is always there. And the mix of options for using that street is really critical for making sure that everyone has equal access to services, health care, all of the things that we think are important. So after working in that job for a little while, um, and coming together with some other interests of mine, I decided to go to graduate school for public health and focus my interest on transportation issues. So I moved to Baltimore, and the first thing I did when I got there was start volunteering with a local bike co-op, the Velocipede Bike Project, uh, which some of you may have heard of. There's a whole movement of bicycle co-ops happening in cities across the United States, Canada, and even other countries, where people get together and cooperatively manage, volunteer basis, a bike shop with, based upon donations of materials and time. And one of the great things I liked about Velocipede and why I became involved with them was I had never owned a car, and I supported bicycle transportation and the mission of Velocipede was around transportation and getting people on bikes, getting people to have bikes who otherwise didn't have other or better access to transportation. So we're serving low-income people, people of color, people from all over the city of Baltimore. And one of the things that I liked best was we had a women and transgendered night. So we had a strong focus in our collective on serving women transgendered people, people of different, um, who didn't necessarily identify as men. And that really created a safe space for people to learn about bikes, learn about how bikes worked. We had people there who never had a wrench in their hand, including myself to some extent. 
So I learned a great deal working there and was able to connect with a part of the population that a lot of us don't have a lot of connection to otherwise. So and certainly wasn't running into in the halls of my graduate school. But it was, in fact, school that the reason I was there. So in school, I started to learn about how health is shaped. And I learned about the ecological model or the social determinant model of public health and how health is shaped by much more than just your genes or your gender, but actually your entire context of where you grew up, your family, what kind of laws are in place or in, in your community have a lot to do with how your health is shaped. And as we all know, income is a great determinant of health. And if you're living in a polluted environment with bad air quality or next to a loud road, then that, those things impact your health. And so thinking about this model of health really shaped how I approached my interest in transportation and not just to focus more on the transportation side rather than just getting people to exercise more. But still I found that even with this model that a lot of the folks that I was learning from were stuck in a more traditional educational model for how to change people's health behaviors rather than looking at the more upstream side of policy and environmental change. So I decided to focus my studies on transportation, the transportation infrastructure and transportation policy as a way to help impact what eventually becomes people's choices and thus people's behavior. So I found my way into a job as a health specialist working in the city's Department of Transportation. The department had never hired someone who focused on health before. And uh, they specifically hired me to work on a project that is as yet unbuilt, but is getting there, the Baltimore Red Line Transit Project. So here's a photo of the project, um, a 14-mile east-west corridor. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this is it created a system, a transit system, that had not really existed prior. And it connected people with jobs and entertainment and recreation. And those are the kinds of things that we're looking at in public health. We're looking at systems, and we're looking at connections and access as the greatest determinants for how our health is. And there is also a social component reuniting the east and west sides of the city, which had traditionally been quite separate. So I focused um, my work on doing a health impact assessment, which is a series of steps to look at how a potential project or policy will impact health for the population where the project or policy will be implemented. In this case, the um, HIA focused on air quality improvements, improving accessibility and connectivity to services, as well as providing new opportunities for physical activity through recreation, as well as along the line, and mitigating construction issues. So what are some of the shorter term negative impacts on health for doing a major construction project for transportation? It can be significant. Some of the challenges of, of doing the health impact assessment, of course, what is the scope of the project, thinking about how far out do I look at the population uh, who lives how far away from the line are we thinking of the people who will be impacted by the project? Connecting to the right people in city government and state government, trying to get the right information. Um, because I was trained in public health, I was initially quite unfamiliar with a lot of the engineering and planning language that was being used as planning the project. So something to think about if you're talking to a health person or a health person is trying to learn about transportation is to be patient. Um, learning some of this terminology, it can be a foreign language, and switching between the qualitative interests of the project to improve social cohesion and improve health, and the data that I was looking at to the quantitative side to actually get there. And then once the HIA was done, there was a real challenge in keeping health at the forefront of the project. So there was 
a lot of activity and discussion around health during my project, but once that was completed, keeping health at the forefront of the entire light rail planning process was definitely difficult. And then I moved on, and now I'm working here at the American Planning Association at a national level. We have 40,000 members across the United States. We have state and regional chapters. We've got a number of divisions. Of course, our transportation division is probably the most active of all of our divisions. So transportation remains, I think, at the core of health of planning and um, for me, for health. But I recently finished a project on comprehensive plans. We have funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who's very interested in how planning and transportation can impact health. And as I said at the beginning, everyone has to get somewhere. That's the kind of premise for how I'm looking at this work. And when you look at connecting transportation with planning, it becomes obvious that destinations are just as important as the routes that we use to get there. So I found doing this evaluation of comprehensive plans from 25 cities across the United States that regarding health, active living was most strongly represented in different chapters in the comprehensive plan. So the transportation and circulation chapters, urban design, parks and open space, and also some comprehensive plans had health elements. So all this is to say that we're seeing more and more connection in our planning and policy guidances for including transportation, health, and planning together. And I'm going to conclude with just a few tips for how you can be an advocate for health, for change, and use transportation and planning to get there. So I've seen uh, through talking with different organizations here at the national level as well as talking with local members around the United States that working with partners from different organizations is critical to getting your message out there and to bringing more people into the process. So if you're in a transportation agency, work with your folks in the public health and the planning department. Um, if you are a public health advocate working at the um, non-governmental level, reach out to friends of parks groups and the bicycle advocacy groups and work with them, partner with them, because you probably have a lot of the same outcomes that you're looking for. You're just talking about it in different ways. There's a lot of great ways to use data to be persuasive about your message. And public health data can be incredibly persuasive when you're looking at it, especially from a geographic perspective. Using imagery and maps to show the distribution of resources, community assets, and then also the distribution of disease rates and crash and injury rates across whatever jurisdiction you're looking at. And then include information on where your bigger assets are, such as hospitals, grocery stores, parks, and transportation and transit, so that you can see how these different factors connect across the city and how they not only how they're distributed, but also how you can make better links to getting there. And you also want to always think about connecting the data to metrics for success and how you can track success so that you can show, wow, not only we're counting people biking on this bike lane, but where are they going and is this actually impacting health? And then, as always, thinking about realistic implementation strategies. Thanks a lot. Anna, thank you. And hats off to the American Planning Association for doing such a great job to bring these topics forward. Um, I just have a comment or two. I'm going to go ahead and switch the controls over to Tiffany for her to get set up. And as I do, I wanted to mention um, I served on our comprehensive planning committee, our citizen advisory group, and we were all surprised that we weren't seeing health as one of the core elements of comprehensive planning, and we decided that it had to be at the core of every one of the core elements. So that was our, our interpretation and conclusion quite a long time ago. Uh, but to your point earlier, where you live does affect your health. And there's a new county health rankings report that I just got a tweet about from
the American Public Health Association. So uh, I think all of us are becoming more cognizant. Uh, and with that, I'm going to welcome Tiffany Robinson. Hi, Tiffany. You might want to check your audio. There we go. Thank you, Kit. Perfect. Well, All right. And I'm, I'm happy to follow Anna uh, simply because she is talking about from the national level, from the APA level, uh, the need for this type of integration with uh, bicycle planning and health. Um, and one of the key things that she said is that everyone has to get somewhere. Um, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about today is making sure that bicycle planning is inclusive of everyone needs to get to somewhere. Um, as Kit mentioned, I am car free, so I am sensitive to that uh, topic. Um, and while I am talking about equity, there is so much more to be said about equity and transportation planning than I can really cover in 10 minutes, but I'm really just going to kind of touch on it, put a little seed in your head um, about things that we should be thinking about. Um, and it's really coming from my experience as chair of the Ethnic and Cultural Diversity Committee um, as the New Jersey APA chapter. Um, so while I'm talking, um, let's see if my slides can advance here. Okay. All right, there we go. So. Throughout the discussion, I'm going to be mentioning certain things, and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what I'm talking about when I mention these terms. Um, so when I say people of color, I'm referring to all racial and ethnic minority groups outside of those that are considered white. Um, when I talk about bike equity, it's talking about not just making sure that all cyclists have access to the road, um, as in you know share the road versus uh, vehicles have the stronghold. I'm talking about providing the equal access and opportunity for anyone to bike regardless of their race, their ethnicity, their gender, or their socioeconomic status. Um, and then lastly, when I talk about underserved communities, it's really those that have those vulnerable populations that tend to be ethnically diverse, um, might be poor, uninsured, or geographically isolated. So I just want to kind of get those out of the way so you understand um, and we're all on the same page. So why are we even having this conversation? Um, in the presenters before me, they've talked about uh, integrating planning into the infrastructure. Um, and really, what has happened is that certain populations have been left out in this traditional planning. And I say traditional planning because I believe that we are moving forward. We're going beyond that now. But still kind of ingrained and, uh, you know, the League of American Bicyclists came out with this report in May of 2013 that says the new ma majority pedaling towards equity. And it's really about that traditional planning, how it has overlooked um, the people of color and they've been left out of these transportation decisions in the communities that they're in. So it's about making sure that when you are in a community and you feel like you are planning for it, that you include those people in the conversation. Um, because you know, in that report, LAB says that people of color are the fastest growing segment of the cycling population. So it's important that we do include, uh, we don't just do our traditional outreach and say, hey, we're having a meeting, that you actively include them into this conversation. And I think it's important because as planners, we like to think that we are you know, we're here for the community, we're here for the people, we're doing all we can for them. But in reality, we are still kind of leaving some of that out. You know, I hate to be the, the, the dream killer here about what we do as planners, but it could be a little bit better. Um, and just here's a great meme that I found about planners and, you know, what we think we do, what society thinks we do, um, and what we really do. And what I'd like to see, um, is just more of that planning really incorporating the people that are reflective of the community. Um, and this quote, um, I've used it a couple of times because it just really makes sense to me and it, I feel like it was really well put about what we need to do um, as planners. 
and it's you know talking about making sure that we are well versed in matters of race and culture, not necessarily waiting for communities to talk to us about what their issues are. We should be actively understanding or finding out the knowledge and learning about the races and the cultures of the communities that we're working in and making sure that when we do our plans and implementation programs, that they do include this element of equity into it. Um, and part of this, I think that the thing that really struck home for me about this is that we have to stop referring to our struggling areas as those communities. There are communities, and, and this is how we have to look at it when we're planning our um, bicycling infrastructure. So as the chair of the Ethnic and Cultural Diversity Community for the uh, New Jersey chapter of the APA, part of what my goal was um, is to really help other planners understand what it is that, uh, you know, who are these people in the communities? What are their, their differences? Um, what are the things that you'd like to highlight? What are the ways that you need to connect with them? Um, and so that was really our onus, is really just having, you know, discussions about it. Um, like it's, I'm so happy to have this platform right now to talk about it. Because while we like to think that we're doing it, we're just not talking about it enough. And we can certainly have easy ways to go ahead and, and make these things happen. Um, but let's talk about what's not there. Um, you can't be what you can't see. Um, I know that this was something that was brought up during the uh, National Bike Summit, particularly the women's uh, portion of it. Um, if you don't see it in front of you, if you don't see women cycling, you, you don't know that it's, you know, really happening. Like, you know, I'll talk about my story, but let's talk about the images that we have out there. Uh, right now I did this uh, screen search for the uh, pedestrian and bicycle image library. Um, and females, the way they do this is the larger that the word is, the more often it appears. Female, as you can see, is pretty small. Um, and when I just clicked on that, tag right there, there are 45 images matching female. And then I said, well, all right, let me see what diversity is. I've been doing the same talk for a while, and I keep hoping, you know, that the numbers are going to go up, but it hasn't changed. Now, this can be attributed to, you know, maybe people have pictures in there and they aren't tagged as either female or diversity, but I think that um, we can do better in that. And I say, you know, you can't be what you can't see because this is my story. I did not, <laughs> what you see there in 2010, that was the only bike that I knew how to ride, was a three-wheeler. I never learned to ride a bike. I did not see anyone in my community riding a bike, it's, and not for commuting, not for recreation. Um, I personally did not learn to ride a bike because I was never taught, um, and so after being teased for so long as being a bicycle and pedestrian planner and not knowing how to ride a bike, I said, you know, I really got to learn. So in 2011, I learned to ride a bike. And then it just, I started to see more people on a bike. Like, wow, there are people out here that are doing this. I am encouraged by this. And seeing the Women's Cycling Project, you realize it's not just people, you know, riding to the park. It's commuters. There are women of all shapes and sizes who, you know, commute in their clothes, their regular clothes, or, you know, commute in their spandex. They're out there. So what I want to see is more people like me, you know? I mean, can we really call this diversity? These are two of the pictures that are tagged in the PBIC uh, image library. And can you really say that these are diverse just because there's one person of color in these photos? I think we can do a little bit better. And for me, it's a civil rights issue. Transportation is a civil rights issue. And it's going back to the idea that everyone has to get somewhere. Everyone should have equal access to get around in the way that they want and not feel forced to get into a car. Okay, So going back to building good infrastructure in our underserved neighborhoods, making sure that we're increasing mobility for those that don't have a car or can't afford to have a car. Um, and then also, let's talk about our older adults, being able to have them maintain a sense of independence. Um, so if we can't, as planners, 
um, really get that far, let's look at our advocates. I think the advocates are really doing a really great job in kind of reflecting the communities out there. Um, I just handpicked a few groups um, for this slide, Red, Bike, and Green. Um, they're dedicated to improving the health and economy and local environment of African Americans. Um, and they have a couple of different chapters. There's one in Chicago, Atlanta, Oakland. Um, and then Black Women Bike. This started off as Black Women Bike DC. Um, and really, all they're trying to do is really just have black women out there biking, saying, hey, it's OK. It's not just for recreation. And even if it is, let's get out and have some fun. But let's get healthy while we're doing it. You know. Um, and then this one that I just found recently is the ovarian psychos. And um, I kind of have this self-censor it there. It says, ovaries so big we don't need no mm, balls. Um, so you can read that for yourself. Um, but they're specifically um, in LA. And I love what they say here is their mantra. LA is characterized by car culture. And bike culture in LA is characterized by white dudes and spandex. And that's why ovarian cycles exist. I just think that the part about LA being characterized by car culture, it's so evident to me now that I'm here. And it doesn't have to be like that. There should be opportunities for, for us to rise above that. Um, and then just the whole breaking the mold about what is cycling. What do we see as cycling? What does this mean? Um, so being able to include women in the, in the images that we see and people of color. And also, the League of American Bicyclists has really stepped up to the plate in terms of their equity initiative. Um, and, and they're talking about all these things. So, you know, the advocates have really gotten in there and said, you know, we want more, diverse, more diversity um, in this movement. So, and others are taking notice. You know, I, I've seen things on NPR um, talking about uh, the Black Women DC and also in the Sierra Club. So Sierra Club gets it. They also had partnered with LAB on that report. And talking about health, it's not it's not just about what you see. It's not just about you know getting from A to B. It's also about health, like Anna indicated previously. So what can we do? You know, we're all agents of change. We need to have more diverse images in our image library and in our plan. What I want to see is diversity, not as the norm, not as a special tag. And when we talk about complete streets, it should really be complete streets for all. And this is making sure you include equity. Okay? Um, and then make sure that we have programs designed for inclusion and outreach to the underserved population, especially the non-speaking uh, residents. So I don't know if you guys have seen this, but recently um, Lean In is a national um, nonprofit that is partnering with Getty Images so that we can see more images of women, particularly cycling. So they're calling it the Lean In Collection. But why don't we have more images of women, you know, kind of diversified? Um, and that's what I'd like to see. That's, that's part of what I'd like to do. Instead of waiting for someone to build up that image library, I'm going to go ahead and give it a start. Um, so look for that soon. It'll be either Instagram or Flickr, um, just so we can start to build that up. And what I want to see is everyday women and people of color like this one. This is a girl that I photographed in MacArthur Park in LA. Simple, doing it every day. She might not have a helmet, but this is how she chooses to get around. And for her to see, or her peers to see her, is inspiring to say, all right, yeah, why don't I get on the bike? Why can't I? That seemed like an easy way to get around. Let me try it too. So that's the conclusion of what I have to say, and um, I thank you. Tiffany, well done. Thank you so much for being a brilliant voice in planning. We will now switch over to Catherine Corden and hear from Catherine. So I have just sent the controls to you, Catherine. And welcome.
Thank you. Am I all set to go? You are set to go. Sounds good. I have been asked to join this not so much because of my biking background, of which I have very little except as an occasional biker, uh, but more as a transportation leadership role. Um, I'm involved in a couple of different organizations that do have a strong uh, place in the transportation leadership world, specifically the Transportation Research Board and Young Professionals in Transportation. So I'll kind of be giving a brief background about both of those and possible ways to get involved in those. Um, a little bit of background about me. I have, uh, I'm a civil engineer all the way through. I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Pittsburgh in civil engineering. And after graduation, I moved to Austin because why not? It's Austin. Uh, where I worked for a few years as a civil engineer at a consulting firm. And then I went back to graduate school at the University of Texas where I got my master's and PhD in transportation engineering. After graduating there, <laughs> I moved to DC and took the position that I currently have with the Transportation Research Board where I've been for the last two years approximately. So uh, I know most of you on the phone probably or on the webinar know an awful lot about the Transportation Research Board or you've certainly heard about it but you may not know exactly where it fits in the grand scheme of things or how TRB is uh, set up once you're inside of it. So TRB is part of the National Academy of Sciences, which is why all of our email addresses end with at nas.edu. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We are not part of the government. We were founded in 1863, thank you Abraham Lincoln, um, who set us up as a way to provide unbiased advice uh, to the government on all kinds of scientific and technical issues. So we have taken that and run with it, and we are so much bigger, I'm sure, than Lincoln ever intended or ever <laughs> thought we might become. Uh, there are three honorific societies that are part of the National Academies. You can see those at the top. The operating arm, the National Research Council, um, that's where stuff actually happens. There are six divisions of the National Research Council, and you can see those there. We refer to them all by acronyms, and that's where we at the academies give uh, the military a run for its money when it comes to use of acronyms. Uh, there are six there. The newest of those is the Gulf Research Program. That was developed as the result of uh, BP's oil spill, the settlement that they reached with the Department of Justice involved them giving the academies $500 million to uh, over 30 years to, to look at the effects that that had had on the Gulf and figure out ways to keep it from happening in the future. So while that may be our newest and snazziest division, TRB is the biggest division within the National Academies. We have the most money, the most staff, and the most publications of all of the academies arm. Um, once you're within TRB, there are the, the part of it that most of y'all are probably the most familiar with is the annual meeting that TRB puts on every year. It's in January in DC, and whoever decided that January in DC was a great time to hold a big meeting, I'm not sure, but that's what we do. We've done it for 90 plus years now. And now it brings in about 12,000 people from around the world to come to this particular meeting. There are more than 200 standing committees um, that are a part of TRB, and many of you are probably a part of the, the standing committees are on every kind of topic you can possibly imagine that is even remotely connected to transportation. So there are quite a number of them that are on active transportation, walking, biking, all kinds of alternative transportation, as that's generally referred to. Um, these are the committees that every August 1st, when everybody submits their papers to TRB, they do the reviews, determine which papers uh, warrant being published or presented, and then do the scheduling of the annual meeting. So there's a number of staff here at TRB that are that staff those committees that coordinate them and keep everything in line there. They not only manage the annual meeting, the biggest thing that TRB puts on every year, but all of the zillions of conferences that occur throughout the year, the smaller conferences that occur in DC and frankly around the world. Another aspect of TRB that um, is reasonably well known to the public is the cooperative research programs, the CRPs. Um, these are sort of like the grant making side of TRB. We put together panels of volunteers who are experts on some particular topic. And those panels put out RFPs, which anybody can submit to to, uh, be con to earn the money to be one of our researchers. Uh, we'll have universities submit. We'll have consultants submit. We'll have sometimes individuals. So then the panels, the volunteer panels, oversee the, they choose the particular person who is going to be doing the research, oversee it, and then the research results eventually get published there as well. So NCHRP is the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. It is the biggest, the best funded, um, the one that most people are probably most familiar with. 
uh, going down the line there, there's also a transit research program, airports, um, NCFRP is freight, and there's also a HAZMAT program as well. I, am, I fit into the slot under the Studies and Special Policies Division. We work on a whole lot of different federal policy issues. Uh, we are doing a lot of reports for Congress primarily. For example, some of the ones that we are looking at right now have to do with uh, determining whether or not truck size and weight maximums should be increased on federal highways. Right now the current maximum is 80,000 pounds. Should that go up? Um, and that's just one of a wide variety of different federal policy topics that we are looking at and working with committees to publish reports on, with recommendations to Congress on whatever that may be. Uh, we also do a lot of syntheses. We put together publications that say this is the state of the practice on whatever the topic of the moment is. Um, so those go out a lot and those are usually very well received as an example of what is going on in the world so that people can know exactly where things stand currently. We also manage the reference database uh, in coordination with European and Asian um, transportation research groups. We make sure that all of the research that you could possibly want on transportation is reasonably well organized and in one place so that you can find anything you want in pretty much one place. And then the last major division of TRB is the Strategic Highway Research Program, otherwise known as SHARP-2. Uh, there was a, it, it being the second Strategic Highway Research Program. It is a 10-year program that is focused very much on highly implementable research. Um, they're very much interested in making sure that whatever research gets done can actually be implemented in a short time frame, unlike some research, which as we all know can be done and then take a decade or more to actually end up somewhere in the field. That's just a brief overview about TRB, and I realize it's uh, kind of a lot of information, but I'm more than happy to take questions on that later if anybody is interested. Another organization that I did want to talk about, and I guess I'm in a particularly good position to talk about it, is the Young Professionals in Transportation. Although looking through the list of attendees, I see that I am not the only one who is involved in Young Professionals in Transportation. I am the international chair of this particular group. Um, it's a professional organization, a nonprofit, that is for young at heart professionals. There are an awful lot of people in our organization who chronologically, I suppose, could never be considered young, or at least not anymore. But we love to have them because they're great people to work with, um, and they definitely enjoy coming to the various events that we have, all kinds of networking and uh, professional development type events. YPT is a little different than some of the other organizations that are out there for transportation because it encompasses every type of transportation you can possibly imagine. Uh, we're not just women, we're not just engineers, we're not just planners, we're not just whomever. Uh, we encompass every aspect from tourism to freight to policy. Here in DC we have an awful lot of policy folks. Uh, we even tell people that if you are at all interested, if you have if you use transportation and you think it's kind of interesting, feel free to come to some of our events. The organization was founded in 2008, so I guess if you're counting, we're still in kindergarten, but we're growing at a rapid pace. Uh, there are currently 19 chapters around the country, uh, sorry, around the continent, technically. One of them is in Canada, therefore we are now an international organization. And we have about 6,000 members, many of whom are under the age of 35, but a significant number of them are not. They're just interested in the activity and vibrancy of the group of young professionals that are the up and coming future of this world. Uh, we keep our membership low at $20 a year because we're aware that young professionals tend not to have oodles of disposable income, and we want to keep the barrier to membership very, very low. So for $20, feel free to become a member. If you're interested in finding out any more information about the organization, you can visit our website at yptransportation.org. Um, and I'm sure that there's information that I meant to say that I did leave out there, but you can probably find a lot of that on our website. And again, I'm more than happy to take questions on either young professionals in transportation or uh, the Transportation Research Board or anything that anybody would like when we're all done talking. Catherine, thank you so much. And your enthusiasm, I bet, is a big reason why Young Professionals is growing so rapidly. Great job. Thank you. Our last presenter is Celeste Chavis. And Celeste, you're going to see a screen to show your screen, a message. And uh, go ahead and click in.
And we're, Can you see the note screen or you see the presentation? Uh, we currently see a blank screen. Hmm. It says I'm showing my screen. You Still might, nothing? Yeah, you might need to go into the choices on which of the... Is that better? Uh, still seeing a, a blank screen. In your PowerPoint controls, you will have an option to show either on a primary screen or a secondary screen. Okay, let me try changing that. It's odd. Okay, and you know what? Others are seeing your screen, so perhaps it it's... Um, oh, it's they were. My, yeah, it may just be my... My controls, that's very strange. Did I mess it up or we still see my screen? People are saying that it's working for you, uh, for them, so I would say if they can see your screen, uh, it's good. And people are okay. saying they can. Okay, well thank you. I think I'm well suited at the end of the presentation since Anna touched a little bit on bicycling in Baltimore and Tiffany covered um, equity in bicycling. So I'm a professor at Morgan State University, and I will be discussing about how we've been incorporating non-motorized transportation into an engineering curriculum. So to begin, um, there's these different groups of bicyclists. I personally actually happen to fall into the interested but concerned group. I'm originally from Ohio, and prior to going to graduate school, in California, I knew nothing of bicycling. And now, since moving back to Baltimore, I'm still very interested in bicycling, but I don't yet feel comfortable enough to bicycle in Baltimore on a regular basis. So I feel that engineering and planning can target this group of interested but concerned people when it comes to cycling. So briefly, Morgan State University is a historically black college and university that is located in Northeast Baltimore. We were founded in 1867, but now we've grown to be a doctoral granting research institution, and we also have the designation as Maryland's Public Urban University. Um, we have approximately 9,000 students, of which 82% are African American, and the majority are from the Maryland area. And you can see that we have a very large population who are from Baltimore City, around 40%. Our department, Transportation and Urban Infrastructure Studies, is pretty unique in the fact that we have um, transportation is its own department. And so we're housed in the School of Engineering but we give a hybrid curriculum that prepares students to become professionals in a variety of fields, whether it be on the planning side, engineering, management, logistics, etc. So it's, it's a very technical program with an applied science focus. So one of the unique things is that our undergraduate students receive over 60 credit hours of transportation-related curriculum. So essentially, their junior and senior years are full of transportation courses, which is unique, as most universities have transportation under the civil engineering department, and it's offered as a concentration instead of an actual degree. So because of that, that puts us in a unique place where we can offer a bit more depth and also breadth to our students. Also, I just want to know, we're um, housed in this building we call CBIS, which is a new LEED certified building, but the purpose of this is to provide collaboration amongst different departments. So this building houses transportation, civil engineering, planning, and architecture. So it also provides a way so that the faculty and students can collaborate across departments as well. So briefly a little bit about bicycling at Morgan State University. In summary, it's pretty much non-existent. Um, the main modes of getting around at Morgan are through walking, driving, and our campus shuttle. 
However, we are aware of the importance of bicycling and are currently in the process of developing a bike plan for Morgan. So one of the problems we have is we're situated on Herring Parkway, which is a very busy high-speed corridor that connects the northeast suburbs to downtown Baltimore. So we typically usually have traffic upwards of around 40 miles per hour um, on the campus stretch. And just north, you can see traffic anywhere from 50, 55 miles per hour. So there are some challenges there to that extent. But it's a pretty um, long and narrow campus. But from end to end, we're talking a little over a mile. So it should be very conducive to bicycling. However, we're not quite there. And if I could find my mouse. OK. So a little bit about integrating um, non-motorized transportation into, in our case, engineering curriculum. So traditionally, there's two main approaches. The first being to add um, modules into existing courses. And so, of course, the benefit of that is it requires less preparation as opposed to developing a course completely from scratch. Also, one of the benefits are if you put these modules into courses that are required for the students, you are enabling all students to gain exposure into bicycling and pedestrian related issues. However, sometimes those issues get hidden in the overall breadth of the course. And so it may mask the importance of bike ped issues. Of course, the second approach would be to have dedicated courses. And this would allow for more breadth and depth of the topic to be covered. But it also requires additional university resources. And you'll be hard pressed to find a professor who says that they have an excess of time. And so that's one of the difficulties when it comes to developing a course from scratch is you have to find someone willing to develop it and also who has the time to teach an additional course. Currently at Morgan, we're taking this approach. And I'm just going to briefly talk about two of the courses that I teach, Introduction to Transportation Systems and Traffic Engineering. So Introduction to Transportation Systems is our first departmental course. It's offered around the sophomore year uh, for students in our undergraduate program. And it just provides a general overview of transportation systems. So on the first day of class, I always do this exercise where I have all my students jot down all of the words that come to mind when they think of transportation systems. And so here is the word cloud from the current semester. The words that appear bigger were mentioned more often. The words that are small weren't mentioned as often. So as you can see, as prior to entering our program, these are the words that the students most associate with transportation systems. Clearly, we have cars, buses, trains, all this motorized vehicular um, traffic. If you notice, bicycling is not on the list this year. It's not always the case. We do have students who are aware of bicycling who are interested, but this current year, bicycling did not even make the list. We do see there's some related categories such as planning, land use, environment, entertainment, but traditionally the students do not really consider bicycling as something that, as a transportation engineer, that they would be a part of planning and designing. So this course is divided into three sections, traveler transportation, planning, operations, and forecasting, and freight. And in the first two sections, I do have sections dedicated to pedestrian and bicycling issues. My second course, which is traffic engineering, which is a very traditional civil engineering topic, um, I also try to include a section of the course on bike ped issues. And my goal of how I look at traffic engineering is to bring a multimodal focus, and that includes non-motorized modes as well. And so we discuss how bicyclists and pedestrians are addressed in many of our engineering manuals, such as the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the Highway Capacity Manual. I also present a section that looks at safety. And so I spend time focused on bicycle and pedestrian crashes in ways that 
um, we can use design to mitigate these crashes. And we also discuss um, some of the things that we do in the field, such as using the 85th percentile vehicle speed to set the speed limit, and if that's equitable from a multimodal transportation perspective. And lastly, also touch a little bit on pedestrians and bicycles when we get into the signals and operations component. Aside from courses, there are some secondary approaches for students who are really interested in bicycle and pedestrian issues. All of our students are required to do an undergraduate senior project prior to graduating, and many have taken on um, bicycling-related topics. Of course, graduate students can do it via their thesis, and faculty um, research is another way that students gain exposure either via presentations from the faculty or also as research assistants. So some things that we're doing at Morgan currently are using ITS and applying that to bicyclists and reducing crashes and accidents. Um, I'm personally interested in bicycle use in minority communities and also in transportation in developing countries. So the next steps at Morgan is to Increase exposure to bicycling and pedestrian issues for our students via through interdepartmental course offerings or also expanding the modules that we currently have in existing courses in our department. And here are our sampling, some related to planning, some related to engineering, and also on the public transportation side. And of course, hopefully, the Morgan Bicycling Plan will be implemented in the future. Um, we're also working on developing a course that will be titled something along the lines of urban sustainability. So it won't be dedicated strictly to bicycle and pedestrian issues, however that will be a significant component of the course. And we'll also address some land use issues, touch emissions modeling, and alternative fuels. So hopefully through that course we will really allow students to get a little bit more hands-on when it comes to bike head issues. One of the things that I've noticed is it's very important that the students have had exposure to bicycles outside of class, which largely is not the case. So we've already touched a little bit about Baltimore. It's a very multimodal city where we have this wide array of modes, including informal hacks where people get into cars with strangers they don't know to get to their destination. So it's a very creative place when it comes to transportation, and Baltimore has a relatively small but very vibrant bicycling community, whether it's through the monthly bike parties and the Bike More advocacy groups. And the city is starting to become aware of the issues related to bicycling. However, despite all these things that are going on, my students at Morgan are largely oblivious to a lot of the things that are going on in the Baltimore community related to bicycling. Um, this is a map of the bike routes in Baltimore where the green are on-street bike facilities, typically denoted by signs or sharrows. There's a few of them that have bike lanes as well. And the red are routes that are traditionally used by bicyclists. So if you notice, Morgan State is in northeast um, Baltimore, which might right here. And you can see we're not very well tied into the bicycling network. So just shy of the picture would be where downtown is. And you can see that a lot of our bicycling routes are relatively central in the city, going through Hopkins up towards Loyola. And being in the northeast side, we're a little bit disconnected. So hopefully, as um, the city focuses on bicycling, we can connect Morgan a little bit more in terms of bicycling infrastructure. And just um, some quick conclusions, some of the things that I've noticed as an engineering professor specifically dealing with bike pet issues is that the modular approach of incorporating bicycle and pedestrian topics has been relatively easy to implement and can be pretty successful in making students aware of these issues as noticed through the number of students who have been taking it on as their um, thesis topic. Um, one of the problems we see, particularly with transportation engineering, is that it typically falls under the civil engineering department, which has historically been focused on vehicular movement and, of course, vehicular-based design. And that's evident through a variety of things, including the FE exam. 
We also know that the design manuals still do not adequately address pedestrian and bicyclist issues. And our students, primarily their interest goes where they see people getting jobs. And right now, there's not too many who are getting jobs in that area. So that concludes the talk and welcome any questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celeste. That was a great presentation. And we do have questions that are coming in. Uh, so in just a moment, we will um, get to those questions. I think the first question that we'll ask is uh, for Leah. And I know you answered this in writing, but people were curious to know what your goal was going to be for increasing the number of female cyclists to that 50-50 mark. Sure. Uh, so the answer that I had provided, I just sent to the original Askers, um, you know, we need to, the first goal um, and the most important is to create safe infrastructure for cyclists. Um, so we need to focus on um, doing more separated facilities. Uh, in Portland, we have a system of what's called neighborhood greenways, where we take local streets and um, make them used primarily for uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. They have the primary right-of-way, and it's very difficult to access them from um, the arterials that go through our city. And those are the highest used streets in Portland by um, cyclists. But um, we also want to get people being able to commute downtown, and we can't do neighborhood greenways downtown, so it's going to be separated cycle tracks uh, is the infrastructure preferred by women. We also need to get bike share launched in the city of Portland. Data from bike share systems around the country have borne out that uh, women are attracted to bike share and it is helping to close the gender gap. And something that I think all the presenters sort of touched on is that women really respond to the sense of community and social fabric. So messaging bicycling as a way to have it as a way of life, connect with your children and connect with your community are marketing campaigns that we need to seriously undertake. Excellent. Thank you. And Fanula, are you lined up to ask the question uh, regarding Strong and Fearless anywhere, anytime? Okay, we're actually experimenting with switching back and forth on Q&A, so um, let me go ahead and pose another question and we'll come back to that. Um, Emma has asked an excellent question about how we can get away from using alternative transportation to using the term transportation options at the federal level. Um, some cities have taken a good lead in that regard, but framing the issue still marginalizes what she says are her main forms of transportation, biking, transit, and walking. So what is the progress that you're seeing, or, or how can we do a better job of, of ditching alternative transportation um, and instead calling it transportation options? Um, perhaps we can start with um, Celeste as you're teaching the next generation. Um, well, I think... Uh, just gaining, increasing the exposure to the, the variety of transportation modes out there. And I think, I know at least in the academic world, we are starting to be more cognizant towards how we phrase things in the literature. And so that may be one approach. I'm not so familiar with getting it on the policy and national level, though. Other input? Catherine, what? Oh, go ahead. I was, oh, go. This is Leah. I was just going to say that uh, uh, I hate to be the the Debbie Downer, but um, it's going to be a very difficult conversation to have. Um, you probably, if you're familiar with the Map 21, bikes and pets, basically, you know, we're screwed in that bill. So, being able to restore the funding for the different types of mode. Um, to me is the more critical conversation we should be focusing on. Um, and if that means relabeling it or rebranding it as something else, um, you know, that's helpful to the conversation. But I think at the federal level, they've basically left the building. I mean, the Highway Trust Fund is set to go bankrupt in July now. 
and we don't have any uh, hint of a federal reauthorization bill, and I think they're just going to extend MAP 21. So um, that's sort of uh, the glass is half empty comment, but it's what kind of sprung to my mind when the question was asked, is that I'm, my, I'm more concerned about getting funding um, for the modes um, and where we, it's where I think that our, we need to be pushing. Excellent. And we've got some suggestions coming in as well from the audience. Um, Maureen says that Oregon uses the phrase active transportation, and ODOT has reorganized some of its group, including the bike ped program, into an active transportation section. And another person, Jim, says that uh, we could use different titles such as um, sustainable transportation and active transportation. So well, well struck. Uh, Catherine, are you seeing any shift at TRB in the approach to, to this question? Shifts at TRB tend not to be the fastest thing in the world. Um, so not a whole lot yet. And we have many members who are very involved in TRB, and in fact, I meant to mention that another free webinar had to do with how to engage with TRB. There's such great research, and in recent years, we've seen lots more interest and many, many more papers on bicycle uh, use and pedestrian uh, use, so check that out for sure. Um, let's go to another question uh, that was posed. Uh, Jim asked, many of us would like to replace the term strong and fearless with anytime and anywhere, or anywhere and anytime. It's a small issue, he says, but worth mentioning. Um, any thoughts about that? Are we, are we scaring people away by even having a category called strong and fearless? I'll jump in here. This is Anna. I think that's actually a really interesting point, and um, and I think to the previous question as well, the way that we structure our lexicon around these topics is really important for shaping how people think about them and how people prioritize them. And so when you say strong and fearless, it could bring to mind a strong, fearless woman, but I think more often than not, just the way that we're acculturated from our young age that will bring to mind a man. And so um, saying something, I forget what the term is, the new uh, proposed term, anytime, anywhere, I think is, is a little bit more inclusive of all of, of actually how that person uh, is approaching their tr transportation choice. Others? All right, um, here's one of those realities of transportation questions from Angela. Oftentimes women take the responsibility of bringing children to school, to club, activities, sports, etc. As I understand, this can be done up to the age of 16. Are there any successful programs through which um, youngsters are taught to bike to school on their own? And if so, how does this help increase the levels of cycling for women. Can a woman jump on their bike and um, go directly to work then or to other activities uh, without having to shepherd people hither and yon? Can I, uh, this is Leah, can I address some of this? Please. So in Portland we have one of the most successful Safe Routes to School programs in the country. We are in 80 schools citywide, which is almost every elementary school in the country and we have made the conscious decision to spend our safe routes to school money educating second graders and fifth graders to be crossing guards at the school so you see second graders um, out there uh, with flags leading anybody who's walking to school across the crosswalks to the school in the morning and then we have fifth graders do uh, bike camps so for a week, we go into the school for a couple hours a day and teach kids how to ride bikes, wear helmets, be safe on hills, um, and be safe on their bicycles. And we have discovered um, that capturing children at a young age like that is what leads to the lifetime commitment of the active lifestyle that we're trying to instill in them. 
I have four children myself, ages five through eight, and I bought a cargo bike to get them around, to take them to birthday parties, to take them to school. Um, and I also use the cargo bike to go to the grocery store and pick up groceries. So there are options out there if you want to make the conscious decision to incorporate a bicycle into your life and make it part of your family lifestyle. And this is, this is Anna. I want to jump in and say that this is also a great place to emphasize the importance of complementary modes of transportation, and particularly transit, to make the bicycle system more sustainable overall as well, because um, children can ride public transportation from a younger age than uh, you might want them going out and biking on a very busy street if those are the only kinds of streets in your area, but they could take the bus. <clears throat> And that gives you more options for getting around on bike or transit yourself if you're not having to drive them all over the place. That's great. Well, we have come to the end of our time together. I, I want to ask Leah just one quick closing question as a follow-up. Um, there was a question about a, who to contact to learn more about your Safe Routes to School Crossing Guard program. That would be Greg Raisman. Um, but uh, let me see, it's, I forget how to spell his last name. R-A-I-S-M-A-N. R-A-I-S-M-A-N. So it's greg.raisman at portlandoregon.gov. Great. He's a wonderful photographer and took the cover picture of our calendar one year. So we definitely... He is awesome. And he is <laughs> the most enthusiastic person to talk to as well. So... Um, please give him a shout out. Great. Well, thank you to all of our presenters, to Celeste and Catherine and Fanula and Anna and Tiffany and to Leah. Just a wonderful job. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. Uh, just to do a quick shout out, not only to our womencyclingproject.info website, but also we're big, big, big fans of the Women Bike Program at the League of American Bicyclists, and they are doing such good work on that topic as well as equity and transportation. So do take some time to check that out. If you're interested in that survey that Fanula referred to, you can find more information about that also at the Women's Cycling Project. And the, the data has uh, probably run its course at this point, but we did have a number of people who took the data and did additional studies on it, which was very exciting. So it's probably time to uh, refresh that survey and uh, find another snapshot in time. I think we've made a lot of progress. Thanks again to all of our presenters and to all of you in the audience who joined us today. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon.